Welcome back. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Raman Muthasamy, who's our next speaker. Dr. Muthasamy is the director of endoscopy at UCLA Health, a professor of clinical medicine in the School of Medicine. He's the medical director for endoscopy for the entire health system, past president of the Southern California Society of Gastroenterology, and associate editor for the American Journal of Gastroenterology. Dr. Muthasamy has been uh, the main of many of our gastroenterologists that are part of the center at UCLA. Uh, has really brought, uh, uh, advanced our ability for diagnostics and intervention and pancreatic diseases. And today he's going to be talking about pancreatic cysts, diagnosing and treatment in 2023. Dr. Muthasamy. Thank you uh, to uh, the Hirschberg Foundation for having me here and uh, obviously for all the work uh, that they've done to help our center. Uh, as well as uh, nationally and internationally with pancreatic disease. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, pancreas cysts today, diagnosis and treatment. Um, and so here's what I'm going to kind of cover in the next half hour. Uh, and again, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the types of cysts that there are, um, what are the sort of imaging characteristics we might see on a scan, uh, like a CT or an MRI, which is most commonly how they're initially found. Uh, we'll talk about what additional tests that we can perform um, on this, and including perhaps sampling or aspirating the fluid with uh, a procedure called endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, we now, in addition to getting fluid, can actually also get tissue from the wall and biopsy the wall, which increasingly I'm a proponent of, and can allow us to more definitively diagnose these cysts to help our colleagues manage them. Uh, and we'll talk about some new novel diagnostic ways, and I'll uh, briefly talk about guidelines, um, and uh, we'll have some summary and conclusions. So by way of note, and I'll, I'll try to keep this sufficiently vague, how many of you either have a pancreas cyst or a loved one with a pancreatic cyst? Just out of curiosity. Okay. All right. Based on the math, some of you probably either don't know it or perhaps maybe aren't raising your hand because it should be about half the room, if not more, um, with the category that broad. So if you take a look at several studies on just, hey, a bunch of radiology studies of the abdomen, how often is a cyst reported? It turns out that it's between 1 in 40 and perhaps as high as 1 in 3. So it's quite common. Uh, and overall, it's around 15%. Fortunately, however, uh, the risk of cancer of any of these cysts is rather small. So, you know, I'm here to sort of, I think, provide some good news here uh, in terms of the fact that for pancreatic cysts, I think the thing I want to keep emphasizing is these are extremely common, and for the vast majority of patients, the vast, vast majority of patients, um, they won't progress to cancer. So our job is to just try to figure out accurately who is most likely to progress and intervene at a point where we can get um, a curative resection. So we know that one of the things that causes these cysts to become more common is, is as we age. So as your younger ages, you see that it's less common, probably around 5%. And then you can see that in some studies, it goes up between 15 to as high as 40%. We looked at this issue at UCLA, um, and I sort of use this data all the time in my clinic. Uh, and if you've been a patient of mine, I probably told you this. Uh, is that if you're 80, there's a 1 in 2 chance you'll have a cyst. If you're 70, there's a 1 in 3 chance you'll have a cyst. If you're 60, there's a 1 in 4 chance. It almost goes exactly in that order. If you're 50, there's a 1 in 5 chance. And you can see that um, <clears throat> about at UCLA, based on some criteria, about 15 to 23 percent of patients had a pancreatic cyst. Fortunately, most of those are less than 10 millimeters, or about 4 tenths of an inch. Um, only a few very small ones are the larger cysts, which do carry some increased uh, potential risk, which I'll get to. So uh, again, if you take a look at, okay, pancreatic cysts are common. Well, how likely are any of these cysts to actually turn cancerous? And that a little bit depends on what type of cyst it is, right? And so if you take a look at all cysts, um, and again, this is from surgical series, so it's probably a selected group of patients that already had some concerning features, which is why they got operated on. It's around 15%. But if you take a look at some of the different subtypes which I'll talk about, it can be 25 to 40%, but 
Other subtypes, um, it can be quite low, and there's something called the serocystic lesion, which essentially is a benign lesion, uh, which has very little uh, to almost essentially no risk. Uh, and again, one of the questions is that certainly we do know cysts can turn malignant, but from the surgical data, again, we've highly selected for the most concerning ones, these numbers are probably going to look a little more scary than probably if you took a look at all patients with cysts. So, and when you tend to do that, um, when you look at follow-up for all patients with cysts, you can see basically the two numbers that I'll probably quote you if you came to see me in the office, which is there's about a 1 in 125 percent, 1 in 125, so it's still less than 1 percent chance, even if you had a mucinous cyst. And if you just say, well, what if I just have any cyst and you don't know what type it is, it's really about as maybe as low as 1 in 400. So, so again, we have a lot of people with cysts, and part of what we're trying to do when we're doing all these evaluations is to figure out if you're that needle in the haystack or if you're not, and they actually probably carry a, a very low risk. So, and again, um, and I'll come back to this later, we're constantly playing this game. We'd love to sort of never, ever operate on someone who has a benign cyst or a cyst that's not going to turn cancerous. Uh, yet we also don't want to miss any that are going to, right? So that would be ideal performance. But um, we often err when we're uncertain in terms of trying to remove it. Uh, but again, we should be careful in trying to um, not be too aggressive because, of course, surgical resection does carry some risk, even in excellent hands. Um, large studies have shown a mortality rate of potentially as high as 2%. I would certainly say that's not the case at our institution. But, uh, but you are able to most likely, you know, you may get some complications from the surgery, and that can be uh, whether it be dietary or fistulas, leaks, other sorts of aspects. So certainly we just want to be uh, cautious and, and ideally pick the best candidates for surgery. Um, now, even if you do operate on a cyst, because there is some concern that there's what we call a field effect, that is the remainder of the pancreas that's not resected may still be at risk, you may still need to undergo sort of imaging and surveillance in those situations as well, okay? Um, and oftentimes, we're still not entirely catching people appropriately, and patients may have other risk factors. And so when you take a look at survival after cyst resection, um, it's not necessarily as high as we'd like it to be, around 35% uh, in some series. Okay, so what are the characteristics of cysts? What are the types of cysts uh, that we're looking for? Okay, so again, there's uh, a variety of different cysts. I, I talked to you about these serous cystic lesions. That's actually probably the one we hope we have uh, because they're essentially benign. There are also some inflammatory cysts that can occur when you've had inflammation of the pancreas called pancreatitis. Um, and then there's sort of these um, uh, IPMNs and mucinous cysts. These are the ones that have cancerous potential. And so those are the ones we watch and we have criteria that we sort of use to decide when we should intervene and perhaps remove those cysts um, operatively. So what we're trying to do when we see you in the office is to figure out what type of cyst you may have and what risk factors you have to determine what strategy we're going to employ, right? And the strategy could either be reassure you that it's nothing and doesn't need follow-up, which is rare. Um, we'll try to tell you which type of follow-up you need um, and how often. Uh, or in rare cases when there's very concerning features, we may tell you that this, you, know, you may need to have this removed. So on the left side are you know, the non-neoplastic, which are essentially benign. Those are inflammatory or um, not cancerous. In the middle are what we call ne neoplastic, or essentially um, you know, have high levels of, of cell proliferation. And, and some can be benign, like serocystic neoplasm, but others are either malignant or, or pre-malignant. Uh, and then there's sometimes, occasionally, you can get a solid tumor, like a neuroendocrine tumor or a solid pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, that can actually um, kind of necrose or actually be liquefy and actually look like a cyst, but in fact is actually ar arising from a solid tumor. Those are relatively uncommon. So our goal is to try to figure out if you have a mucinous cyst, which is, again is, has cancerous potential from a non-mucinous cyst, which doesn't have cancerous potential. That's really what we're trying to figure out, okay? So I told you a little bit about this, and I'm gonna go over this at a very high level, um, but these are cysts that are, often have a honeycomb appearance um, they have lots of little pockets, but a small percentage of them won't. And that's the problem is I can give you, I'm going to kind of describe the classic, but the problem is there's non-classic, right? And so the question is, 
If it's non-classic, how do you figure it out, right? Because it's not, doesn't have all the features, right? So these are usually more in women. They tend to be more in the left side of the pancreas, the body, and the tail, as opposed to the right side of the head. Um, but essentially is, is benign. It's important to find these because it's difficult to diagnose this. And as my surgical colleagues can tell you that in most of the published reports of large surgical resection series of pancreas cancers or pancreas cysts, you'll find that there'll be 10 to 20% of the patients would have had one of these that hadn't been recognized and got operated on. If we'd known that, um, perhaps we may not have needed to operate on those patients. So this is what they look like on these imaging studies. It's sort of, you can kind of see here. Uh, let's see if I remembered how to do this. Yeah, so you can see this is the cyst, and you can see there's kind of a pocket and a pocket and a pocket here. So this is that honeycomb appearance that I was talking about. So this is a mucinous uh, cystic neoplasm. These are almost exclusively in women, uh, usually in the left side again. Um, the risk of cancer is around 15%, and they have this special um, ovarian stroma, which um, on surgery or if you take a biopsy of the wall, um, that's a very characteristic finding, which essentially proves that's what it is. These usually tend to have a single pocket, as you'll see here, uh, and uh, you can see this is a cyst here. So unlike the last one, which looked like it had a lot of little pockets, this looks like one simple lake here, and it's in the tail. So this is a pretty characteristic imaging. Again, these are classic imaging, but there's always the atypical or the sort of non-classic imaging, which is why it's hard for us to sometimes figure these things out. Um, and again, this is probably the most common type of cyst now, this IPMN. Um, and this is a, a mucinous cyst. Um, you can see actually what looks to be mucin here, because it is mucin. Um, that's uh, um, not showing up now for whatever reason. Oh, there we go. Uh, you can see this mucin. This is the opening to the pancreas duct in your small bowel. And you can see this sort of glue-like material there. That's the mucin coming out. And this can predispose you in some cases to developing pancreatitis, other things. This isn't common to see this, but if you do, it pretty much makes clear what's going on. Okay, and there's different subtypes, which I won't bore you with the details on, but um, we use that sometimes to predict your level of risk in those situations, okay? Um, so when the main duct, you know, again, you can think of the pancreas drainage system as like a river system, right? There's a main duct and there's little tributaries that come into it. So we call those the side branches. So when the main duct is dilated, like the one you just saw where mucin was coming out, the risk of cancer is very high. 40 to 50 percent, those patients almost always get recommended for surgery, section. The branch duct types um, are the ones that are the most common, where there's the side branches, but the main duct is normal. And those often have variable treatment strategy based on sort of the size of the cyst and other factors I'll get to. And then there's a mixed type where you've got a little, little bit of dilation of both, and we kind of treat those very similar to the main ducts in terms of their level of risk. Um, and those generally tend to be operated upon. Okay, so here's a couple of nice pictures. Uh, this is, again, you can see the main river here. Uh, reason, there we go. So here's the river, and you can see it's really dilated. This should usually be just a couple of millimeters, and this is actually probably three to four times that, particularly down in here. So here's another one that looks, uh, again, you can see this is what the real size of the duct should have been. And now you can see there's this sort of large sort of cystic, um, sort of multi-lobulated, a lot, a lot of pockets there uh, in that one. Uh, and then here uh, you see one where you've got, um, again, multiple of these. You can see a large one here, several small ones that are along the way. So there may be, sometimes you'll see a dozen or more. Um, and again, this is what we call a mixed type. Uh, where we've got um, the main duct is dilated, but then you also have um, a side branch off here on the side. So these are some of the different kinds of cysts. Lastly, there's a, a fairly uncommon type of cyst we often see in young women who uh, called a, a SPEN, a solitary pseudopapillary epithelial neoplasm, does carry some risk, and usually the patients are very young. Short answer is those usually get operated on as well. Okay, and this is what they look like um, as well. They often come in with bleeding within these cysts or maybe trauma that causes bleeding, and then it gets found that way, okay? So in this era of uh, where your medical results get released to you on the health system, oftentimes before we may have had a chance to talk to you in the office or describe things, um, I get a lot of phone calls like, oh, I got my results, uh, I, what, what, am I, what does this mean, right? And so um, my goal here is to kind of just give you some idea of when we discuss patients in our clinical conferences, what we review, what are the factors, so just so you can kind of get a sense of what we're looking for. So 
Uh, we look at factors that, uh, you know, symptoms. If, are you jaundiced? Is this thing causing a compression of the bile duct, which runs through the pancreas, and so therefore it can cause that? You could have, um, uh, look, we're looking for a small solid nodule within the cyst, which could be concerned for a growth or a mass suggestive of an early cancer. Um, or if that main pancreas duct, the, the river I told you about, if that's more than 10 millimeters, because it's normally supposed to be three to four at most, if it's more than 10, that's of great concern. So um, the other worrisome features, uh, which, I'll, which I'll, you know, again, if the size is more than 30 millimeters, is a wall thick, um, if there's sort of other less significant dilations, okay? But these are some of the factors we look at. Um, we also look if you've had a history of pancreatitis, if there's elevation in certain tumor markers, um, and if there's a biopsy of those biopsies show any evidence of abnormal cells, okay? Um, so that's sort of what we're looking for. So these are the factors we put together to sort of create these um, plans for patients. So, so the role of endoscopic ultrasound, uh, as I like to describe, is you can kind of think of CT or MR as satellite imaging and uh, sort of an EUS, as, as I like to think of, as a hot air balloon. We're actually a lot closer to the surface. We're literally on the other side of the gastric wall from your pancreas, so we're literally looking from a couple of millimeters away. And at least conceptually, we should be able to see subtle, smaller abnormalities that might be missed on a CT or MRI, theoretically. Okay, and so uh, again, here's uh, an example of a cyst on ultrasound looking through the stomach. You can see we can put a needle into the cyst and even sample small areas. Um, and here is a small sort of nodule. This actually probably is actually just a ball of mucin uh, within the cyst. So we can use these things to help identify like how big is the cyst? Does it communicate with the pancreas duct? Um, does there a nodule uh, and so forth? And then we can actually sample that. Now, we really only do this for cysts that we are worried about. So for a very small cyst or one that we think is inflammatory or in someone whom we don't think we're going to do anything with the results with, or if the imaging is so classic that we really don't, the MR is it clear that it's what it is, we don't need to put you through an invasive procedure uh, to tell you that. Because, of course, these things, you do have to get sedated. There's anesthesia. Um, if we do a biopsy, there's a small risk of inflammation of the pancreas. So, so if we do do a biopsy or, or put a needle into the fluid, we can get cells from it or run chemical analysis with different kind of compounds. As I mentioned, we could cause inflammation of the pancreas. There could be some bleeding, uh, sometimes fever or infection, although relatively uncommon. So we like to pick these things very carefully. Now, this is some data which basically suggests that in patients who have a mucin assist, again, that's what we're looking for, um, they tend to have a higher level of the CEA than those who don't have mucin assist. So that's one of the tests we run for that reason. And we're typically looking for a number that's around 192, but again, nothing's perfect, right? So if you're 193, does that mean you have a mucinous? And 191, you don't? No, it's not that perfect. But when it's very low or very high, that helps us help distinguish between these cysts. But again, as is the theme over and over again, there isn't usually one test that is, especially if it, unless it's a clear biopsy, that will give you an answer on these types of cysts. So we use this inflammation, and this is really more for the physicians, but we uh, use you know, characteristics. If it's low, is it high? And then we can kind of categorize this into which cyst type it is. Now, uh, Dr. Brand, who's going to speak to you this afternoon, his colleagues uh, at Pittsburgh have really done a lot of work with molecular testing. Um, and as I've already told you, there's a lot of times we're still, after all this, we get an MR, we do an ultrasound, we get some of this fluid. We're still a little bit confused. We're not sure. And maybe perhaps we think you may have an IPMN, but we're trying to figure out what level of risk you have to progress to cancer. We can run molecular testing um, to help determine what type of cyst it is and perhaps maybe even predict um, its behavior as it goes forward. And so there's a, a lot of studies that have looked at this. Um, and in cases when we're not sure, uh, we often sometimes will use that. And I, I won't get too much into the details of, of um, uh, the numbers here, but I just remember that's an additional test that we can do. One of the things I'm most interested in these days is glucose because it's a super easy test to run. It's just a sugar in the fluid, and it doesn't cost very much. It can be run multiple different ways, and it turns out it's super accurate. In fact, it may be as accurate or more than some of the more expensive tests that we've been using. It turns out that if you have a mucinous cyst, it tends to 
have very low glucoses, and if you have a um, non-mucinous cyst, the glucose tends to be higher. And if you take a look at this, this is a summary of a whole bunch of tests, different studies, eight studies, 600 patients, compared to seven studies using CEA. It turns out the glucose actually performed better, um, probably about 10% more accurate uh, than the, uh, the CEA. And it turns out, a lot of times in medicine, we say, okay, well, you have A and you have B. Well, A and B might be better than A or B alone. But it turns out from looking at this data, not really. It seems like the glucose alone um, may be as better than the CEA, and one wonders that as we move forward whether we'll need to use the CEA as much. Now, uh, in my last few minutes, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tissue because so many things in medicine are determined based on, well, what's the answer, right? And the answer usually comes from getting tissue. So we've traditionally tried to take the fluid and suck the fluid out and then spin the fluid in the cells from that. And it turns out the short answer for that is when you get a clear answer, like if they say, hey, we see cancer, that's useful. But most of the time, it's not very helpful because you don't get enough cells and you could miss a lot of things. So it turns out it doesn't really help that much. So people have tried a lot of other things. What if you put a little brush and like brushed against the wall of the cyst? Um, it turned out that didn't work so well either compared to what we were doing, and it actually caused a little bit more complications, pancreatitis and bleeding. So uh, people said, well, what if we put a needle in but then took a little biopsy forceps like we do when you get a regular endoscopy and get tissue? And so there's been lots of studies that have looked at that. And in fact, it seems to be reasonably good, about 80%. Um, but it requires some technical, it's a little bit of extra expense, and there's, you have to use a little bit larger needle than you might typically have used. Um, and so, but that is another technique that we're increasingly utilized to try to get more precise answers. Um, something that we've pioneered here uh, and have published on is using just a, a, what we call a core biopsy needle, something we often use now for pancreas, solid pancreas tumors for cysts, where we sort of take a cyst, suck out the fluid, and then uh, take the collapsed walls and biopsy across them. And in this study here, we were able to get a diagnosis essentially on about seven out of eight patients we did this on, which is far higher than many patients. I'll show you a couple of examples. This is a patient who came to my office from Las Vegas who was 28. Uh, she, had a family, um, she had a family friend. She didn't have a personal history, but they had a family friend who died of pancreas cancer who she had been involved with caring for. She was very concerned because at 28, she had a pancreatic cyst that was um, uh, of reasonable size. And she was so concerned, you know, they weren't able to give her a clear answer in Las Vegas. Um, and so they didn't have enough fluid for that molecular analysis I told you about. So she wanted me to do a repeat ultrasound with sending fluid for molecular analysis. And she actually told me, if you don't get me an answer, I'm just going to get this resected because I don't want to have what happened to our family friend happen to me and she wanted to do that before starting a family. So we did an ultrasound. You can see the picture with our probe there with the sort of the, the black uh, fluid in here. Uh, and uh, you can see the uh, cyst there. And then what we do is you can see our needle, and we just start aspirating the cyst down. And then once it's gone, we sort of bopsy across the wall. And it turned out, even though this did not look like a serous cystic neoplasm, and that is not what I thought it was when I saw it in the office. It turned out that's what it was. In fact, they put that on the pathology report. And so that's exactly what we were hoped for. Uh, I was able to tell her you have a very low risk. This essentially it's benign. Um, she avoided the resection and actually proceeded on and, and sent me a photo of her newborn a couple of, uh, a couple of years later. So uh, again, a couple of other types of cysts we've done using this. This is a patient, a little small to see here, but this was another serous neoplasm uh, at the top. Uh, and then here's a patient actually who actually we referred um, who had, did have some concerning features, but this was actually a patient who ended up getting resected at our center who had high-grade dysplasia um, on aspiration of the cyst and biopsy of the wall. So we're increasingly able to get tissue, which was a challenge for us um, in doing this. Now, what are some new diagnostic methods that we have? Um, we, uh, again, there's something called contrast-enhanced ultrasound. One of the challenges we have is, is when we see a little bump inside of a cyst, right? You see a little bump right there, right? Is that real or is that just a little bit of mucin? And so we can kind of run tests to see if there's sort of blood flow or not associated with it. This turned out there was some blood flow that was real. Uh, and that was a nodule, but here's another bump in a cyst 
where there's no blood flow, and it actually turns out that was just mucin. So, so this may be able to help us more intelligently predict whether it's really a nodule or not. Um, and our colleagues in Japan, this isn't quite approved in the United States, but it is a technique we might be able to use. We also have the ability to put a, essentially an in vivo microscope. We can, through the needle, put a little probe that allows us to see down to the level of cells and that's another technology that we could use. It's a little bit expensive. It requires a little bit of uh, contrast during the procedure. I have used this less as we've moved more to actually our being able to get a frank biopsy. Uh, but we actually have this technology available at, UE, uh, at, um, at UCLA. Uh, and then again, this is just a study showing that this can help you um, compared to just those standard like glucose and CEA and amylase and some of the traditional tests. So we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years in diagnosing cysts. Now, I won't uh, go into the details about guidelines, but again, there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's no shortage of people who are telling us how to manage these cysts. As we can see here, there's Japanese and international consensus guidelines, there's European guidelines. In the United States, we have three major GI societies, each of which has its own guideline. Uh, and I see Randy nodding his head here. And, uh, and so anytime there's that many people telling you what to do, that's probably because we don't know exactly what there is the right answer, because if there was, we wouldn't need six different ways to tell you it, right? So, so I would say that we use an amalgamation of these guidelines. Um, uh, and again, the key issue with all these guidelines is how do we balance the risk of doing an unnecessary resection versus the risk of a missed cancer, right? And so you'd like to get that exactly right every time. Um, Turns out, unfortunately, it's not perfect. The big things we do look for are a low cyst more than 30 millimeters, a dilated duct, or a solid component to the cyst. I kind of I showed you those. Um, very small cysts that I told you don't need a US. We can just follow with an MRI or, or CT, usually MRI to reduce radiation. Medium-sized cysts with features that are concerning can get an EUS, and high-risk cysts may get an EUS prior to getting a surgery. If it's pretty obvious, you may just do a surgery. Um, this is the ACG guideline. I'm not going to try to explain it to you in detail, but essentially it allows you to use the technologies that I've used to stratify patients into those that you can sort of forget about, into those that you need to intervene and probably have a surgeon see right away. And then a large group of people follow in the middle, and with the evidence that we've accumulated over the past 10 to 20 years can be managed um, you know, with you know, fairly evidence-based approaches um, over the past years. And then most patients will get followed usually for a minimum of five years, but based on your age and how healthy you are and other medical issues you may or may not have, um, that surveillance could extend for a longer period of time, uh, but perhaps maybe with imaging less often. But most imaging occurs either annually to every other year, uh, when it's a little bit higher risk, maybe perhaps even every six months. In terms of treatment, traditionally it's been surgery, and uh, I won't spend too much time talking about that. Um, there are a few ways of treatment that have been developed with ultrasound. I just showed you we can stick a needle into a cyst, and so maybe instead of taking just aspirating, maybe we could inject into the cyst, and we could inject different agents. So traditionally that involved initially alcohol, but increasingly it's involved the use of certain chemotherapeutics, uh, and it turns out that um, you know, there's reasonable evidence to suggest that some of these can, you know, actually be eradicated. But even if you get rid of an individual cyst, just like I told you about surgery for cysts, uh, there's something about the tissue that suggests that even if you preserve the pancreas, you could develop a cyst later on somewhere else. So you may require, uh, most likely, surveillance, continued follow-up um, to make sure you don't develop another one somewhere else or at that same site. So and if you take a look at how well these have worked, um, about 75% of the time they were able to get rid of the cysts, and the best cysts were less than 35 millimeters and just had one pocket. So the more pockets they had, the worse you did. Now one question is, do we really need the alcohol? And I'm not talking about ingesting it, I'm talking about injecting it. Uh, and, uh, and so in this case, the answer is, Maybe not, um, because alcohol is associated with a lot of the side effects from these cyst ablation procedures. But using these chemotherapeutics just with saline, salt water, may work just as well without nearly as many adverse events. It went from 22% with alcohol injection and none in the saline group. So I'll close uh, by talking about uh, some take-home points. So cysts are common. 
and they're increasingly diagnosed on cross-sectional imaging. Uh, and so, as I told you, if you're 80, it's about a one in two chance you're gonna have it. Um, these exhibit variable behavior, but the main thing that we're trying to figure out when we have our conferences is this a mucinous cyst or not a mucinous cyst? And then if it is a mucinous cyst, we're trying to figure out what clinical and imaging characteristics are to figure out what your level of risk is and how aggressive we should be or not aggressive we should be. Um, the FNA of the, from the EUS can be useful in sort of intermediate to higher risk cysts to get additional information. Um, as I told you, some of the things we can get a CEA, a glucose, an amylase, um, and then perhaps molecular testing. Uh, and we can also get tissue from that to help provide more definitive answers. Um, and again, we've got pretty, pretty sophisticated algorithms now, and I think in the future, um, you know, we're looking for even better tissue sampling to be able to more precisely tell you exactly what you have. So to conclude, um, like most things, we tend to get anxious about things we don't completely understand, and there's been a lot of anxiety associated with pancreas cysts because we really didn't understand them, and I think we're increasingly comfortable with managing them, and that's probably led to us to be, uh, to maybe cut down on our operative rates. Um, we need to provide both patients and providers, primary care physicians uh, and others, uh, my fellow gastroenterologists, that they don't need to worry about many of these because the overall risk is actually still relatively low. Um, and again, even though I've shown you there's a whole bunch of guidelines, you kind of have to take each patient into their own account. And I think future biomarkers, better tissue acquisition, and perhaps new technologies on cyst ablation may allow you to manage this. I'll close with something that I'm working on right now. Um, we are thinking, we have a technology now that can put steam through a needle. So we can actually aspirate the cyst and then use very high powered sort of steam to essentially ablate the entire wall. Uh, and that may cause it to influte. And it actually is basically the treatment agent is just water. So, uh, so there's some new technologies. Obviously these things are away, quite a bit away from clinical utility yet, but you know, we've made a lot of progress in the last two decades and I look forward to seeing what comes next. So thanks for your invitation to be here today and I'll take some questions. I have a question online. Um, somebody asked, my dad passed from pancreatic cancer. Do you suggest I get screening for cysts, and if so, at what age? Yeah, I think that um, sure, we certainly don't have routine screening for cysts at this point. I think if you're talking about for cancer, I think usually that involves more than one relative, uh, unless there is some evidence perhaps of genetic testing suggesting that there's a high risk, right? So, so usually it's two or more first degree relatives uh, or if there's certain conditions that are associated with it. So, you know, if there's some reason for a familial history of cancers that may suggest there could be a familial component, maybe perhaps seeing a genetic counselor and then, oh, yeah, there's some questions in the back there, yes, so, or comments, yeah, they're right. So that can be useful. We do have some, you know, pancreas, uh, cancer panels now that are available that, uh, that can be sent for, um, and so that might be something to, to have a conversation with, with their doctor about. Um, hi, I have a question. Is there any correlation with cysts in the colon? Like if you have a cyst in your colon, does that give you a better chance of having a pancreatic cyst? Uh, not to my knowledge, um, and I think colonic cysts are actually quite uncommon um, in general. We don't see those. I mean, we see a lot of polyps, but we don't see a lot of cysts per se. Um, I'll, I'll slightly twist your um, question a little bit, and the question a lot of patients ask is, is having two cysts worse than having one? And some people say, well, doctor, I'm at great risk. I have seven cysts. And, uh, and that's a, actually a very frequent question that I get. And the short answer is we usually judge it based on the, the cyst that has the most concerning factors. So if you had seven one millimeter cysts, or you had one cyst that was 10 millimeters, or 15 millimeters with a nodule or a dilated duct of some sort, you'd be much worse off just with one cyst, right? So, so it's really not so much the number of cysts, but how many of those criteria I discussed that you have. So I have a quick question. As uh, one of three siblings who we both had grandfather and father pass from pancreatic cancer, and we've 
tried to do the, um, the EUS, how often would you say we should, we've all tested negative for um, any of the BRCA genes. Good. How often would you suggest as um, just a, you know, exploratory? And then the second question is, it's always a fight with the insurance companies. How have there, are there any ways to get around some of that? Um, great question. Um, you said that you had two, uh, it was grandfather and father and... Uh, our grandfather and our father. Yes. Okay, and, and, uh, okay. And, and just to be clear, it was the paternal grandfather. Yes. Perfect, yes. okay. So I, I think in that case, you should be good. You've got two folks, uh, you know, sort of with direct lineage, and so that would typically meet criteria. I've not, I think Randy's yeah. interested in making a comment here as well, but... I think, um, you know, sometimes what I tell people is who have a family history, who have a concern, um, especially if there's another family history of cancer, that's where maybe genetic testing, if positive, can help, you know, facilitate that. But in your case, you actually have a pretty strong family history, I think, that would meet most of the criteria that I wouldn't think it would be hard to, to make an argument in your family's case. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, to answer your ultimate... Uh, we tend to do uh, typically annual examination. Um, I usually start with an endoscopic ultrasound. I mean, my own practice is I'd like to do in the U.S. annually two years in a row the best test twice, and I kind of just look. As long as I don't see any sort of significant changes, then we typically alternate a, a non-ionizing um, radiation, usually like an MRI test, with an U.S. Uh, on an annual basis typically. Randy, I'm going to Yeah, no, I was just going to echo that, that... Uh, uh, you do meet criteria for what we call familial pancreatic cancer and annual EUS or MRI. I, I have a bias for EUS also because I think it picks up small solid lesions better. But you're, I was just going to make a, a, a little side note that typically if you're the person who's doing the surveillance on you, and I'll be touching a little bit in my talk about this actually because clinical sort of my clinical trial, that if you see that doctor writes a nice note summarizing that this is in criteria with NCCN guidelines, my patients usually get coverage. It depends insurance to insurance, so we always tell them to double check that. But really, it comes down at the end of the day of having a good clinical note, not like a colonoscopy where you just show up in the GI lab and get a screening colonoscopy. You actually meet with the, the person who's doing surveillance. That will go a long way, just that one meeting for making the coverage easier yeah. with documentation. Yeah. Not a question, okay, but just wanted to thank you for that uh, Sunday morning where you came in, gave me that ERCP, cleared up the problem with my lever. We're great, thank you. Okay, thank you so much.